going on, you guys? What's up, Paul? The harvest market went well. I'm gonna tell you all about it. And uh, I even uh, filmed the whole vlog over the weekend, and I'm gonna post it. I got a really late start today, and so uh, I've just, I, I've, I've been editing like most of the day, and I couldn't get it finished. So I'm like, I'm just gonna go out, do a live stream. I'll get that vlog from the weekend posted tomorrow, so you'll see it. But um, I did want to come out and uh, do a little bit, of, do a little bit of work out here. But uh, what's going on, you guys? Welcome. Happy Monday. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just get right into this because for anyone who clicks this title, clicks the thumbnail for uh, you know for the the topic that I suggested um, or that that I titled it, it's about uh, sewing with two different colors of thread. Um, and the reason this came up is because I was uh, sewing a little batch of our key pieces. This is just the shape of it before it's, you know, folded down like this and uh, it'll look like that with the hardware coming off the top right there. But um, anyway, that's just the shape before it gets stitched. And uh, this one is a little bit, a little unique. This one has a shell, Ricardo shell cordovan on top in whiskey, and it's got natural tooling on the bottom. And that's a really cool, uh, unique look. And um, it just got me thinking, I've actually been uh, really tempted to just try this out on a lot of, basically any of the leather we have on hand. I've been wanting to make some wallets with the exterior uh, shell, shell cordovan, um, a russet, buck brown, black, anything but have the natural tooling on the inside with that underbelly, you know, two-tone. And I'm actually not a huge fan of two-tone, honestly. Um, I know a lot of you are, I don't wanna like offend anyone, but I just, I'm not a huge fan of two-tone. I'm such a, I'm just a simple guy. I like really simple, straightforward things. And so two-tone usually just doesn't do it for me, but if the two tones we're talking are, you know, one color, whatever color that is, I don't, you know, whatever, that's a different thing. But the second tone, if it's that natural tooling, like a really, you know, it's a neutral color. It's something that pretty much just goes with everything. And uh, you can, I, I think that would make for some really beautiful products. <laughs> Expand your mind. Yeah, no, I, I just, it's just a, it's just a creative difference. You know, some people, I've seen a lot of wallets that are like multicolored rainbow. You know, a lot of that like Patero stuff is really brightly colored and, and it's, it's awesome. I'm glad everyone's kind of gotten their own style. I've just haven't, that's just not really my, uh, my creative choice. Um, I'm unpicking one of these key pieces because I just started stitching away on it and I uh, noticed the tension was wrong and so the whole thing just, just looks terrible. So I'm gonna unpick it and restitch it. But by the way, that could be a whole video in and of itself. <laughs> this is like, okay, so yeah, I mean, you can see the tension is just way off. It was skipping stitches and I didn't even know. So I'm pulling all that out, but what's hard is when I go back and sew this, I have to make sure the needle lines up in every single hole just perfectly. So it's gonna be a little bit different than just typical just sew right through it. Um, I'm gonna have to make sure that needle just drops into the right hole every single time. So it's a little bit difficult, but it is possible. It's possible to recover it from this. You cannot send a piece out with uh, tension issues. I've, I've done it in the past and I kicked myself for it. You know, As I was learning, I'm just figuring this stuff out over time and uh, now like if I see something with bad tension meaning like the knot from the stitch is up top or on bottom and it's showing or it skipped a stitch I just can't have it I don't I, I can't do that um, okay so let's get to this so everyone please hit the like button thanks so much Kim you're the best Luke hey black t-shirt day <laughs> every day is black t-shirt day lately Seriously, I have like seven of them. So I did pretty much what I was talking about. I just, I wear one like every day now. Um, it's not, it's not like a fashion choice either. That's just uh, it's like the antithesis of that. It's like, so I don't have to think about it. I just throw that t-shirt on, good to go. All right, so um, these are the two colors I'm working with today. This one doesn't show very well because it's almost gone on the spool, but this is one of my favorite colors of thread. And I'll show it to you on the cone. So I've already got it set up, but that is called beige number two, and the brand is called Filtech. So if you're looking at the Filtech thread brand, 
their color code or whatever is called beige number two. And it looks so good on like russet harness or even this whiskey uh, Ricardo shell cordovan. So it's just a beautiful color. I love it. It's kind of golden. Okay, so the point of this video was to talk about this instance when 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 you've got two colors of leather and you want the top grain or you want you want the top piece of leather to have a certain stitch of color in this case we're gonna have it be beige so it just really blends in and kind of disappears into the background that's what I like I'm, I'm not as much into the contrast stitching the real obvious like big bold stitching anymore I really like to just kind of have a subtle look I mean it just depends on the product sometimes that works really well but but in this case I just want to go for a really subtle stitch and this beige color will just just kind of really complement the uh, ricotta so or the shell cordovan so on the back side I always love to use white colored thread Brady's here <laughs> right on I was I was worried um, I love to use white thread on natural veg. It's like one of my favorite looks. It's just clean. And if you go with anything darker than white, it just kind of looks muddy. And I know I'm getting into like opinions here. This is, you know, if you like, like black thread on natural veg, great. I love that. Go with it. That's your style. I'm just kind of telling you what goes through my mind. Um, I really love white thread on natural veg. I just pretty much always go with that. So um anyway if you were to just sew this like you normally would with the matching you know with 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 the color that you want up here and then the the same matching color sorry i forgot that i'm plugged in my phone's plugged in and then you've got the same color down here in the bobbin you're just you know that's how you normally sew you match those two up but with a sewing machine you actually have the option of throwing one color in the bobbin and a different color on the top cone and, and getting two different colors, which is really cool. Um, I, I guess you could say that's one benefit you get out of sewing with a machine that you don't get by uh, stitching by hand. Um, if I were gonna explain that, look, let me, I'm, I gotta draw this out for you, hold on. I'm taking you with me. Keep these sewing machine vids coming. Right on, will do. Gotta grab my pen. This is my trusty Everyman Co. pen. Can't get it out one-handed. <laughs> Got it. Um, I'm going to get out a piece of paper here and just kind of like illustrate this a little bit because there's no way I could possibly, uh, I don't know, explain it. Whew, that sun's coming in hard. I'm going to bring you over here and drop it down. Sorry guys, this is, this is what you get with live streams. You don't get, you don't get the cool whip pans and the smooth transitions. You get me just walking around in some harsh lighting. Okay. So with a, you, most of you have probably seen this over and over again, but let's say you're looking at the edge of your leather like this. And uh, normally when you hand stitch, you're gonna take, like let's just say you got your needle here <laughs> and uh, your thread going through. <laughs> okay, so this, normally this thread would come down and go through a hole and then wrap around and basically do this right everyone's familiar with that and when you're saddle stitching you're going to have two pieces of thread so here's your second needle and you know the thread going through wait a minute yeah anyway um and then your second one is going to come and basically do the opposite of what this thread did and it's going to go in that hole wrap around go back down that hole i should have used two different colors of pens that would have perfectly illustrated this but basically what you get is sometimes let's say this is red and this one's blue that causes an issue because sometimes this red one hold on no, I don't have any I don't have like any markers or anything so that's not gonna help but so let's so if this one's red well it's going to be red right here and it's also gonna be red right here up on top so on both sides of your leather, you're getting red thread. And same with the blue. It's going to happen on both sides. Well, on a sewing machine, you get a lock stitch. And uh, I know a lot of you have seen this. This is very familiar to most people. Um, but on a lock stitch, you have um, your threads going to 
go in like this and then stop halfway through the leather and come back around like this. That's, that's what getting the tension right means. You wanna make sure that the tension, the knot is being pulled right in the middle of your leather right here so that it's not showing on the top or bottom because your second piece of thread is gonna come in like this, loop around that on the inside and just do that. Does that make sense, you guys? I know this isn't the perfect way to do this, but that way I can have the top of my thread it up with a thread. This is red. And it's going to show red all the way through the top. Where the bottom, let's say this is blue, it's gonna be blue all the way through the bottom. So you don't get any of the mix up. So I guess, let me bring you back, hold on. Woo, right. Makes perfect sense, right on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Horrible uh, sketches there. Okay, so let me bring you back now. I know that, that a lot of people will argue that that's the downfall of a sewing machine is that you're working with a lock stitch instead of a saddle stitch. Um, and and I'll, I'll give it to you, a saddle stitch is going to be a lot stronger in the end. There's no doubt about that. But there's also nothing wrong with a lock stitch. I've never had a problem with it. It does to me, you're doing a great job. <laughs> Sweet, thanks Al. Al came up to the, har uh, the harvest market on uh, Saturday and we chatted for a long time. It was really cool to see you. Thanks for coming Al. Um, so anyway, we've, we've, we've talked about the differences of, of those two types of stitches before, so I don't wanna get too deep into it. But that, I guess you could argue that is one beautiful benefit of using a sewing machine over the, the uh, saddle stitch by hand. So what we're gonna do is use that beige color on top and I'm gonna do white on the bottom and it's just gonna, mm, it's gonna look good. So here's what we got going on. I just threaded up the machine with beige and I'm just wound a bobbin. I wish I could see what I'm filming here. Sorry, this, this is not ideal <laughs> filming situation. I just wound up a bobbin with white. So I'm gonna take this and drop it into my bobbin case. And I'm gonna need two hands to do this. Let me see if this is possible. Uh, maybe. <laughs> oh, geez. Does that work? We good? We here? I don't have very, uh, I don't have a lot of freedom here where I put the, the tripod because it's, it's pretty big actually. And I can't go any lower. I'm on a pretty big tripod. So anyway, I apologize, but I'm just gonna drop that bobbin into the bobbin case. And if you have any questions about how to thread a, a Juki 1508 like this, I just did a fully extensive, thorough description on how to do this. So don't get too upset if you're like, whoa, how does he, how's he doing this? All right, so I'm gonna drop this back into my needle because I pulled it out when I was winding the bobbin. Pull that through. All right, I'm gonna drop this down and pick up that white thread. Bring it up to the feed dog. And there we go. We've got, we've got russet on top and you've got white on the bottom. You're probably not seeing this super well. You know what? Actually, there's probably a better way I can do this. Hold on. Um, Gary Sproul, what's up, Sproul? How you doing? Okay, I'm going to actually drop the legs. Stay with me here. I know this, this is not, this is, the, this is what you get with live streams. I'm dropping the legs on my tripod really quick so that I can set you up real nice. Okay. How's that? It's a little better. Thanks for the S&B hat. I have only one take, oh, I've only taken it off for church. <laughs> That's a, that's a good policy there. Okay, so I think this works. That's like a pretty good, uh, pretty good location. Feeling good about it. Benjamin Johnson, thank you. All right. So we've got, I just wanna give a special shout out to the previous owner of the, to this machine who cut my plate in half. I don't know why he did that, crazy. Yeah, the 54s are coming back. I'm just, I'm slowly getting to everything. 
Um, man, between vlogging and production, it's just, there's just a lot going on. And uh, Russ, our uh, manufacturing partner in Connecticut, he's just been completely booked out. He's so busy. So I'm trying to kind of pick up the slack. Um, so anyway, we'll get there. We're trying as, as hard as we can to get everything back in stock. Um, all right, so let's do this. I've got my uh, top shell cordovan, underbelly, natural veg, and I'm just going to start sewing this little ditty. I'm going to keep tension coming off to the right on that thread so it doesn't pull through to the bobbin case. Back stitch a little bit. And we're good. I'm bring my light back. You see how we're looking on tension? Looks pretty good. I was messing a lot with tension uh, during that last video, so it's, I've been kind of struggling to bring it back. It just takes some time. It's better if you can just grab a scrap piece of leather and get it right and then you know you're good to go but i tend to forget to do that and i just start working on projects and go oh man my tension's off and then i make adjustments and get that point now i talked about this in my last um in my last video when you're making a sharp corner like i'm at the very point of this thing and i'm gonna have to fully rotate that thing around to start going the other direction. So anytime you do that, you wanna bring your needle all the way to the bottom and then back up just like a quarter inch because that just gets the timing all right on that thread and the hook and everything so that you're not gonna skip the stitch. Now I can lift my foot up like that and turn it all the way around as much as I want and it's not gonna try and skip a stitch. Just a little uh, helpful tip there. And I'm gonna keep rolling. Someone just said, is that mine? <laughs> uh, it can be. I, uh, I whipped a bunch of these up for the harvest market. And when we got down there, we just flat out, we just didn't get any together. We were gonna be like, you know, stamping stuff away, pressing the button snaps as we were kind of watching people walk by. And that just wasn't the case. Instead, we literally had people at the booth 24 seven. It was crazy hectic. And uh, so they didn't end up getting made up which led to no one buying them. So yeah, I, I'll, we'll just press a bunch of these, get the button snaps in there, ready to go, and I'll add them to the website. Well, I don't think these technically are on the website, but I'll, if you wanna, just send me a DM and I'll send you an invoice. And right now I know Greg Kessman is like, yeah, right, Parker, <laughs> because I told them to do that for me for a couple times uh, for a hat and I spaced it. I just kept forgetting and I finally got the invoice out to him. So we're gonna ship him one. All right, I'm back to the original stitch. So I'm just gonna back stitch a couple times and maybe just go back. I kinda, I, I go back and forth. Like sometimes I just back stitch twice. Sometimes I go a full three times. Just depends on how I'm feeling that day. Snip that. I can always tell when Wit's in shipping mode up there at the house because the printer just starts going wild. Whoa, I didn't even know my foot was under the tripod holding it up. Okay, so here's the magic. Look at that, we got that beige number two Filtec color on top and on the bottom, it's white. It looks great. That's, I just love that look. You probably wouldn't even put too much thought into that if you were to, you know, like just order this product, you'd be like, oh yeah, cool. Like you just wouldn't think about that stitch, but that's two different colors in one stitch. Um, so that's a really helpful thing. And, and can like potentially really give your products a unique look. My phone's dying, so I'm gonna plug back in. Hi, bro. Looks great, thank you, Paul. All right, plugging us back in here, stay with me. Ooh, blown out. 
All right. So anyway, that's it for this for this video. I mean, we can sit here and chat some more. I'm all about just hanging out. But um, as far as, you know, if you were in the future and you decided just to click on this video to learn something about stitching with two different colors, that's it. You got it. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, if you have any questions, let me know. But how, how do you find it selling at market and festivals? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. How do you, how, like, how did it go? Uh, it went really well. I've... Is the same weight thread on both sides? Yeah, it would be pretty, I mean, I just always keep my machine set up with the same weight going through the both, you know, if you, changing weight on thread is, is quite a bit of work actually. I mean, especially on the bobbin because you, it's, it's not easy to adjust the tension on the bobbin. There's just little tiny micro screws that you can, and it's micro adjustments to get the tension right. And so I just don't really like to mess with that. I've been working with 92 weight thread for, as long as I can remember. <laughs> Hello from Chicago. What's up, Joe? Um, I just want to give a little shout out to, to everyone that came and visited at the Harvest Market. We had we had a lot of people from YouTube showing up. Um, Bryce and Karen, um, uh, Al Ruiz showed up, um, Taylor Coburn. We had, who else, uh, Phil and Rach, and uh, Jed and Whitney. I mean, gosh, there were just, there was a, just such a cool, I mean, that was, that was really cool to me because there were people there for the harvest market, you know, there at Sundance, just vacationing, having a good time, and they just happened to stroll up to our booth, and that's great, we love that. But it was also really cool to see people who showed up, like just for us, they watched YouTube, they showed up to come find us, I love that, it was really cool. Um, what brand thread do you use and why? I just, I used Filtech on this one because they're the ones that have the color I really like for that nat, the, uh, it's called beige number two. Um, but I get it from the threadexchange.com. They just have a pretty awesome, uh, variety. Yeah, so just go look around at Thread Exchange. I, I'm not like picky about the brand. I don't really, I mean, so far everything I've tried is really great. As long as it's like bonded nylon, it's, you know, you're in pretty good shape. Hey from the leather shop in Whiteville, Tennessee. What's up? We got Dick Absher. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, Parker, for your wallets, what size thread do you use the most? Any poly bond you like the best? Um, yeah, I, I mostly used 92 weight thread for a while there. I went through a little bit of a stretch using 69 and, uh, it was, I, I like that too. It's just a really like subtle stitch. It's really clean looking, you know, you're able to use a smaller needle so you get less apparent holes, you know, cause the bigger you go, that was one of my big issues with my harness stitcher when I was sewing, I started out sewing with 207 weight thread. That's big that's really big thread and the needles are just monsters so every time that needle goes into the leather it's essentially it's a stitching all and it's just punching a hole so i started realizing the smaller the you know the the what's the the lesser weight that i used in thread the smaller needle i was able to use which just gave a really clean clean look so uh, the 69 is a, is a, was a good option. I just I went with 92 because I, I had a huge um, collection of 92 weight thread here in the shop that I'm just kind of working through. So 69, 92, somewhere around there I would use. Um, I'm missing some stuff here. Can't wait for the 54s to come back. Cool, Richie. Thank you. We'll we'll get them back. I'm those ones are like I can whip them up pretty quick. So I'm gonna get on that quick. What color are you looking for? I've been doing blacks. I keep making black. 54s and they just as soon as I put them up they sell out so uh, Russet okay, we can do that. I want to make you some russet 54s. I don't I can't give you an exact date I'm just trying to get to everything as fast as I can, but I'll put that up at the top priority list Pine top brand the thread exchange is money um, Yeah, I'm gonna do a video about this because I get a lot of questions about what needle and thread size to use and uh, the Thread Exchange is actually a really good resource because they, they have a page on their website that's called the Thread Guide. So 
you, you, depending on what weight thread you want to use, you can look at their chart and, and it'll tell you exactly what needle you want to use. Because that stuff's kind of over my head. Like, the numbers are pretty, I mean, some of you are going to be like, okay, this guy's stupid. But, I mean, the numbers are, are it's, it's, it's a pretty, like, complex measuring system. Let me see if I can get that to focus. No, it's not happening. <laughs> Well, there's like, there's like three factors you gotta weigh into. These are 135 by 16. Try, oh, I'm trying to remember what this means. I had it all dialed in at one point, but since then I've just, uh, since then I've just like always bought the same needles and used the same thread. So I really don't, rem I gotta look back into it, but go on Thread Exchange and they explain it all. Um, I'll do a video about it. I'm gonna have to do some research and kind of remind myself what each one of those numbers means. It's like tire sizes, you know, like those, those, man, you get into like the metric stuff and it's, it's so completely different. Um, have to go. Thanks so much for sharing. Have a wonderful and blessed rest of the week. Tell your lovely wife I said hello. I will, Kim. Thank you for being here. Triangle? Question mark. Um, circle? <laughs> Square? <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know. I might, I must've missed something. Is there a question? Uh, John Flippo, besides district leather, what's another suggestion for leather supplier? Lots of leather out there, out of stock at district leather. Oh, um, yeah, there's, there's so many. It's another great video idea that I need to do. Oh, try, you're saying that's the, okay, I got you. That makes sense, KH. Yeah, th these must be like the triangle shaped needles going in, which is great. I love that diamond stitched look. Um, okay, so leather suppliers. For anyone beginning, I'm always gonna throw out Tandy. I love Tandy. They just have they have a, a, just an amazing selection for, for what it is, and it's so accessible. There's stores in like every city. I think in Utah we have like I don't know five stores maybe. There's there's a lot, so they're everywhere. You're always gonna be able to find a Tandy and get some great leather. Um, if you really want to start getting into like the higher end leather, you know, like the Italian stuff. Um, Obviously, District Leather Supply, they have the Italian stuff, Japanese, some of the best American tan leather, like Horween and um, Wicked and Craig. So, District Leather Supply, obviously, I put that out there. You said they're out of stock of stuff. Rocky Mountain Leather Supply is another really great one. They've got some, like, really unique stuff. Uh, Butero. Um... Hide and Leather House in California is a great option. They don't have like as much of the specialty stuff, like the high-end Japanese and Italian leather, but they've just got like a really wide range of affordable hides um, all across the board. They've got all like the oil tan, rugged utility type hides. They've got softer, milled, you know, goat skin, calf skin. I mean, they've got everything. You, there's nothing you can't find there unless you're looking for like the really specialty you know, Japanese stuff. But they even have like a lot of the American hides like Herman Oak and Wicked and, no, I don't know if they have Wicked and Craig, but they've got Herman Oak. Um, so yeah, Hide House is a great one to look at. Um, Maverick Leather is a really cool one. They get seconds batches from Horween and, and a few other uh, suppliers too, but you can go find some like Chrome Excel and some uh, Cavalier and Dublin, some like really nice hides that have like minor imperfections and get them for a great deal at Maverick Leather. So go check them out. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, gosh, there's so many more. I need to come up with like a comprehensive list and we'll, we'll just tear into that, maybe do a whole video on it. Where do you recommend looking for used sewing machines? Man, oh, Springfield Leather, it's a great one, Kimbo. <laughs> I wish I knew your real name, or maybe it is Kimbo. It's Kimbo Slice. Um, okay, so sewing machines, I don't know. If I've, we have a classified website here. It's like the local news. KSL has a classified section on their website that's amazing. Like you can buy and sell everything there. It's, it's used really frequently here in Utah. It's like one of the, I mean, it's really popular here in Utah. I'm not sure what, I'm sure every state has something like that, but. I'm not a big fan of Craigslist, so I've just never gone there. I hate, I hate the website. I hate it's so. There's so many scams on there. I just, I tend to not use Craigslist. 
but I've usually found a lot of used machines on KSL Classified. So whatever Classifieds app you've got out there in your state, probably be the best place to start. Um, and then also Dane Sewing Machine or Dane Sewing in Murray, Utah here. I mean, they're based in Utah, but they, you know, they, they'll ship anywhere. I'm, I'm, as far as I'm aware of, I'm pretty sure they'll ship anywhere, but you know, that's the tricky thing is like, you want to find a good affordable sewing machine that you don't have to have delivered to you on a, you know, on a freight truck. It's just gets a lot more expensive. So that's just, that's one of those things you're gonna have to figure out, I think in your local area. What about a video for weight of leather for different products to make? Yeah. So yeah, that's a great option or a great idea, Paul. We've done, I've, I did one a long time ago. Like one of the very first videos I made on YouTube was um, how to choose the right leather for your project. But it's very dated. I mean, the information's still accurate. I still stand by it, but it's just a very dated video. I think it could be done better. So we'll definitely do that, Paul. What I dropped down here? Oh, my thread. Oh, sorry, I, Italo. I wish I spoke Spanish, or is that Italian? It looks Spanish to me. I don't speak Spanish, I'm sorry. Have you stopped using Wicked and Craig? No, we still use Wicked and Craig. I use it for, I use their harness, uh, russet and buck brown skirting, and I use Wicked and Craig for our natural tooling. So I, I would say they're like, they are our like primary supplier still. Um, if I were to change anything, I think I might go away from using harness just because of the, we've talked about this, the, the scratches. It's just, it just gets dinged up really easily because of that jack glaze. Actually, no, I take that back. It's not the glaze. In fact, the glaze helps. I was talking to Bill from District Leather and he was saying that he got a whole batch of unglazed harness and it actually was scratching up even more than the glazed harness. So it's just that harness leather. It has something, you know, some uh, trait in that leather just causes it to mark up really easily. And honestly, it's it's great for like a personal project. I, I think the markings just add character. You know, we've all talked about that. Like there's a lot of, you know, the, the unique traits of each hide is what creates character and value in leather to me. But when it comes to selling products, I mean, we, you know, we're making hundreds of wallets and if it has a scratch on the pocket or something, even if it's not a deep scratch, it's just a mark that could be buffed out with a t-shirt. Um, people get really upset and want returns. And so we found ourselves doing a lot of returns. And in the end, it's not a huge deal because we get the return back and I buff it out and send it out again. It looks great, but it just adds a little bit more frustration to our customer service side. Um, so I may move over to skirting. I'm such a big fan of skirting. It's like matted. It's a little bit, It's it marks up a little bit as well, but it, you, you get the sense that that's how it's supposed to be more so with the skirting because it's so rough and matted. You're like, yeah, that's what it's supposed to do. It looks like it's supposed to have some scratches on it. Not like big, when I'm saying scratches, I mean just like little, you know, scuffs and marks, like nothing huge. If it had a significant scratch, of course we wouldn't send it out. We always like try and stay real tight on our quality control. Um, but I love the skirting from Wicked and Craig, so I might explore that. Or bridle. I love bridle. It's really expensive, but... Um, yeah, and then that, that fourth option we have is the vintage brown from Hyde and Leather House. It's, they call it Ruffman, brown Ruffman oil tan hide at the hidehouse.com. So, yeah, so that's, no, they're actually cheaper than Tandy's. I'm missing some stuff. I don't know why the conversation just sometimes disappears while I'm chatting. I realized I'm missing a bunch of stuff. Wicked and Craig's kind of expensive. Uh, yeah, they are. They definitely are. But you're, it's, it's, you, you get what you pay for. You know, Wicked and Craig is really high quality. It is, especially with their natural veg, like the natural tooling and carving. It's the best carving leather I've ever seen. It's so clean. Um, so, yeah, it just depends on what you want. You know, you kind of get what you pay for in that sense. Um, okay, I got to go way back. I'm missing stuff. Oh, man. Whew, see, this is crazy. I, th I thought no one was commenting anything because the conversation, the uh, message board just disappeared. All right, I'm going way back. Helping here from Gary. He said Springfield Leather Company and Weaver, both great options. Uh, do you ever feel constrained by a flatbed? Yes, sometimes, like when I'm sewing patches on hats and certain aspects of sewing a bag, I wish I had a 
cylinder arm again. So I might invest in one again sometime soon. Kimbo says, no, nope, it's not Kimbo. You're just hiding, You're hiding behind Kimbo's name. I want to know who you really are. <laughs> Hamilton said, that's a great name. Every time I see that, it just kills me. Toledo Industrial Sewing Machines, they're, they're awesome. Do, they, they deal with cowboy, I think, right? Cowboy sewing machines. Um, what about a video for weight? Okay, saw that one. I've been checking on there. I'm just up north of you in Idaho. I'll just keep looking, appreciate the info. Uh, that die that you had made by True Cut that has all your patterns for one of your wallets, does that big die work on your Mighty Wonder? Yeah, it does, but I would not recommend that. It's just, it's not a good way to go. I much prefer having each individual piece separated. And even more so, I don't like having the big board that's kind of covering the die itself because you place that on the leather and you can't see where you're placing it. So I've seen some people make it with like an acrylic piece that's uh, transparent so you can see through it. Because you want to be able to, you know, butt your die right up against your last cut so you're not wasting any leather. And with those big wood boards, like you have no idea where you're putting it. So that was just one of the things I learned, you know, over time, like, well, not buying that die anymore. And uh, now we get them from National Die. Okay, geez, these messages are just flying through. I'm missing so many. Uh, if you're just starting out, you could get away with a heavy duty sewing machine, or do you have to purchase an industrial? No, I mean, just, just try it, just try anything. I mean, if you have a domestic machine, try working with some thinner leather and, you know, see what you're able to do. Um, eventually it probably would be smart to get a, a heavier duty industrial one that's just designed better for like pumping out faster. You know, it just makes your process faster and more efficient. So it's just, just work with you, what you've got though. That's, I'm always a big believer in that. Take what you have and do your best with what you have. Don't, don't ever like stop yourself from getting into something or like making the next step just because you don't have all the perfect gear or equipment or whatever. You know, I've, I've talked about this many times. You know, it's just like with the, um, what Joe said about not having, do I feel constrained by a flatbed? Yeah, I do sometimes, but I'm not gonna let that stop me from selling hats and, you know, making certain bags. Like, we make it happen. You know, it's, it's it just, just make it happen. You have to buy direct from them. Um, let's see, since we're on leather and quality of leather, is it cheap? Is cheaper leather the reason for my crappy edges? Haha, ha, no matter how much burnishing and sanding, I always seem to get fibers popping. Okay, Jason, that, that depends on the type of leather you're using. If you're using like an oil tan leather, you know, something that's chrome tan, you, you're not gonna get very smooth edges. That's just what it comes down to. Um, vegetable tan leather is always gonna burnish better. And then within that umbrella, there are certain types of leather that will just burnish better than others. So. Yeah, it probably has to do with quality, um, but not always. It could also depend on where you're cutting from the hide. Sometimes if you're like down by the belly or one of the lower grain areas of the hide, it just, it's just not as, it's just not a, you know, it's a, you get more of those fibers popping up and things like that. So, um, yeah, it's funny though. I remember having that same problem. Like I, when I very first started, I bought an oil tan hide and I remember thinking I'm gonna, burnish myself like just a perfect glassy edge on this thing and it you just can't do it it just doesn't work on oil tan leather um so shell cordovan burnishes really nicely chrome Ex chrome excel is like one of the only chrome tan hides i've seen that you can still get a pretty decent edge on um but other than that it's really tough okay see again all the comments disappeared and i'm missing them sorry guys uh, Boise Sewing Center, I think, sells used machines. At least they used to. Someone here to see us? We got the fam here. Hi. Hi. What are you guys doing? Um, Andy, you got a Barbie? Dance Barbies. Dance Barbies? Yeah. Good. All right, got to bring these comments back up. Uh, thanks for the info. I'll check there. Yeah, nice pine top brand. I love that. Pine top brand. Remind me of your name. I can't remember. What'd you find, an acorn? Yeah. Oh my goodness. You lost it already. Now we got an acorn free in the shop. What are we gonna do? What leatherworking job do you enjoy the most? Mine's burnishing. Uh, yeah, burnishing is a very gratifying process. I'll give you that. Uh, sewing's like really it. fun. You what? I don't like it.
But I think that's because of the way, like we, in the past you get stuck burnishing a lot of like straps and straps aren't as fun. But like if your goal is to just get a really glassy edge on like one wallet and you're working with really good leather, burnishing is really fun. And if you have your process down, then you're good to go. What leather working, okay, just saw that. Jordan, gosh, you've told me that before and I'm so sorry, but I'm gonna remember this. Jordan from Pine Top Brand, thank you so much. I love all the contributions, everyone just like pitching in ideas. You paint the edges now, will you offer the raw slicked burnish edge again? Um, Paul, this is, this is like, uh, this is something, we've gone back and forth with this for years and years. It's so funny how like our ideas and our preferences can change so much. You know, I remember when I first got into leather work, I looked at edge painting as like some curse, like some, you know, oh, I would never do that. And I think that's because I've seen painted edges from some of those really poorly made bags overseas that you see at like department stores and the edges are kind of cracked and falling apart. And so it's, so I get it. Like the idea of painting an edge doesn't sound great, but some of the best bespoke makers out there that I've seen, like some of the Japanese guys, some Italian makers, I've seen some that are just, oh, it's so beautiful. And they paint their edges. They use really high quality paint like Vernis or uh, Uniters. And you're going to get a really quality edge that's just beautiful and uniform and it doesn't peel or, or flake off over time. It's, and it's actually really flexible. So as the leather bends, the paint will bend with it without cracking. It's amazing stuff. And <clears throat> once I decided to just start working with it again, I really grew to love it. I really love it now. And the beautiful thing is it's just helped our process. Like uh, being able to, so let's say, let's say you just put yourself in our shoes. Let's say you have to make a batch of a hundred wallets. Um, when you're burnishing by hand, all you're trying to do is just glass up that raw edge. Um, you really have to spend a lot of time on each individual corner and every side. And there's a whole process of sanding, you know, with the different grits, you start out with like 300 or sorry, start out with like 150 and then uh, go down to 300 and then, and then go down to like a canvas cloth and use, you know, different burnishing agents like tokenol or whatever. And it's just a long process. So if, if we're talking like a one-off bespoke wallet, I still love to uh, burnish the edges. And, and every now and then I just like to do it just for fun anyway, because it's a fun process. But when you're making a hundred wallets at a time, um, it is so much more efficient to be able to just slick it down once with water and then go over it with that edge paint. Uh, because it's, it's a lot more consistent. You know you're gonna get the same result every single time. You know that you're gonna get a clean edge and the color's gonna be proper. Sometimes when you're burnishing um, the raw edge without any ink, you can darken up the leather by heating it up too much, using too much friction, things like that. So there's, there's a lot of factors that come into play that make it inconsistent. So again, there's, there's a lot of reasons when you're, when you're making big batches and you have to do something over and over again there are a lot of things you can do to help improve that, that don't sacrifice quality, but really improve the process and, and improve efficiency. So I hope that answers your question. Um, but most, I'd say, mo yeah, all of our products right now are, uh, we, we ink them up on the edges. Uh, it's all good, man, I can't remember the names either. <laughs> I'm gonna get yours, Jordan, I got it down now. Jordan from Pine Top, I don't know. Jordan. Jordan from Pine Top. I'm gonna remember that. I just tried to come up with like a little thing in my head to remember that. I couldn't, <laughs> but I'm gonna remember. Does the quality of paint make a huge difference? I've tried Tandy's edge paint, I peeled and flaked off within weeks. Definitely could be user error. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I, I'd like to work with Tandy edge paint myself before I make any you know definitive decisions there because I've never used Tandy's edge paint. But I, I assume it's, it's good stuff. Um, it just really depends on the, you know, I, I found that when I slicked the edge down first, even if it's just with water, slick it down so that you're getting rid of all the, the fibers and the bumps and things like that. Just you want to get a really smooth surface. <laughs> we got the boy vacuuming over there. Um, if you start with a really smooth, clean surface, then I think that paint is just going to look so much better and, and you know, it'll, it'll uh, tack on a lot better. 
But I don't know, just try out lots of different stuff, see what works. Um, Ekis Leather has a video where they use edge paint. He uses a hot iron with the edge paint. After that, yes, that's, a, that's an awesome process. Um, again, that's one of those things that you wanna do if you have the time to put into each individual wallet. So if you're making one-off projects, yeah, that's a cool thing to do. Lay down one layer of edge paint and then come back over it again with the hot iron and you'll just get a really flat, smooth surface because you're doing multiple coats. Um, so we, we only do one layer of edge paint, but even if you don't have a hot iron, you can sand your first coat of edge paint with like 300, you know, something really fine. And then I go over with a canvas cloth and do another layer and you're just gonna have a beautiful edge. Um, but we just do one layer. I just slick it down once, lay down my uh, edge, my coat of edge paint and good to go. It just looks great. Uh, Parker man, thanks for all the help. Thanks for putting so much time into these videos. Love tuning in. Remind everyone of the maker hashtag you want the community to use. Yes, thank you, Jason. That's a great idea. Um, I, I've been loving this idea of like sharing, you know, everybody kind of sharing the process, um, kind of tapping into the community and learning from each other. Um, and, and vlogging has been the best way to do that for us. Now, I know vlogging is not for everybody. That's, it's a tough thing to do, especially doing it daily, but it has been so rewarding for us. And if this helps make your decision any easier, our orders have just been like through the roof since we started vlogging. And I'm not saying that to brag, I'm saying it because I just think it, it just, it helps you tell your story. It's, it's the most genuine, authentic, transparent version of your story because it's real and it's raw. It's just like this, it's like a live stream. We're just, you're seeing, what you see is what you get. This is us. You see my family coming in here, Indy playing with Barbies on the workbench. Say hi. hi. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, I think that maybe by seeing somebody's real story, their, you know, what's really going on behind the scenes, you gain a little bit more loyalty to the brand and you're more likely to purchase from them. Um, so, I don't think there's anything special about our story or anything, but I, I think that um, the idea of vlogging is just adds this whole side of uh, marketing that only us makers are capable of doing, are able to do. I guarantee you big corporations would love to be able to do what we get to do and be really intimate and authentic and communicate with our followers and customers the way you know we can like this um, and have it seem really personal and intimate you just you just can't do that in uh, big corporations and things like that so so the, that whole idea kind of uh, sprouted up the, the the hashtag maker vloggery I just want to see more of it um, start a channel start filming yourself making your products whatever you know whatever your process is. it doesn't have to be like our videos but but if you're a maker <laughs> He's just Wes is just doing whatever he can to make noise. Hey, hey, <laughs> are you making noise? Are you? What do you have to say to the people? All right, see you later. Um, so anyway, the whole point of that was it would be really cool to see a bunch of makers cropping up, documenting their process day in and day out, filling orders, um, you know, learning. Imagine that, imagine being able to go back at any given point in your career of starting and running a business and seeing, um, you know, watching yourself learn things and, and being able to learn from others. And there's just so many benefits that come from it. So try it out. There's been quite a few people that are jumping on board and it's so cool to see it. Um, and I'm not saying uh, these guys specifically did it because of me. I think maybe they had already been on, on this train, but it's so cool to see uh, Ryan from Little King Goods starting to do a vlog. I hope he goes daily soon because I love his videos. It's so fun to watch. He just did a market over the weekend like we did. So it was kind of cool. We're like, we were doing the same thing. And um, uh, uh, Mason from Primo Goods, Primo Leather. It's so cool to be able to watch these guys. Like, you know, they're in the same, they're doing the same thing we're doing every day. We're, we're sitting in a shop, pounding away, filling orders, making stuff. And uh, it, it's, there needs to be more community there. So hashtag maker vloggery, let's get it. You're the reason I'm even looking into a machine. Your videos are super informative and encouraging. Well, thank you, Trout, I appreciate that. 
Uh, Paul says, yes, thanks for sharing your knowledge, my friend. Got to go. It's 1.22 a.m. here. Bye to you and your family and everyone. Wow. Yeah, you need to get to bed, Paul. Thanks for, for joining in anyway. Your videos have inspired me to dive back into my leather working. Thanks so much. I still have lots to learn, but excited. Cool. Well, thank you, Crystal. That's so awesome to hear that. Um, since you called out all creatives and makers to start a vlog last week, I decided to start one. No way, Jordan. <coughs> Man, see, are you using maker vloggery? Because I need to like check on that frequently so that we can like, I want to know when people are starting to vlog. Uh, I decided to start one, should be ready October 1st. So thank you for the inspiration for that. It's scary, but I'm excited. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. I can't wait to see it, Jordan. Um, and just so all of you know out there, if anyone wants to do it, I mean, if anyone wanted to try this out and I see that you're consistently posting over and over and you're really putting the work in, I have zero problems uh, giving you a shout out and sending my subscribers your way. Um, that way we can all kind of lift each other up and help out. You know, I don't want to do it if, if someone just posts one video and then gives up. I'm not going to do that. I want to see somebody like consistently putting in the work, grinding, making it happen, making good, unique content. And uh, yeah, I would love to, to give you a shout out and, and not just do a shout out, but like collab videos and stuff. What are you doing over there, Wesley? You working? <laughs> you took the mallet from me. <laughs> What are you making over there? Um, a tether. Oh. Yeah, we the website. Did, did, how did we get an order for that? It's not? It is. I'm pretty sure I took them off the website. It's not. Hmm. All right, I got to check on that. Did you ever watch Ian Atkinson or Nigel? You know, I did, I did see a couple, Ian, a couple of Ian's videos, um, but it was kind of after I had already gotten into leather work. Um, I'm trying to think of who I watched. I can't, I don't, I don't think the people I was watching were consistently posting. I think I remember like learning from very, uh, like, you know, just some one-off videos that people had put up. There wasn't anyone that was consistently putting out lots of good content to follow along and learn from. Um, I think Ian was out there. I just hadn't found him yet, but he's done a great job. Um, let me think here. I, and I know Tandy had a little series of videos that I actually learned from. I think I learned how to saddle stitch from them. So, so it was out there. There just wasn't a lot of it. Rocky Mountain Leather has custom colors of heatable edge paint now. Yeah, that's their Uniter stuff. It's like, it's, like, it's like Home Depot house paint for leather work. Like you can go in there and mix the color you want and get exactly what you want. I don't know why my face is so blown out. Am I like right under a light or something? It's, it looks weird. Okay. I wish uh, YouTube would just keep the comments up because it disappears after like one second. Ian's two hour video on hand stitching was my biggest lifesaver when I first started. Oh, that's cool. That's awesome. See, and that's the thing. I think every maker can, can bring different things to the table. Like I've never made a video about hand stitching. It's just not my specialty, but there were zero videos about sewing machines. Well, there were a lot about sewing machines, but not about specifically sewing leather and sewing the type of work that we do. So that's why I really wanted to uh, get some videos up and kind of offer something a little different that's not, you know, that I, I may make a hand stitching video too. <laughs> Bye guys. Is, uh, are you making dinner? I can smell it on you guys. It's done. Oh, okay. I'll be in soon. What? They already ate? What time is it? To be fair, it is like, okay, it's 6.29. Make a wish, that was my motocross number back in my racing career. Um, Ian posted a lot, but lately not so much. Yeah, I noticed that. I wondered um, if he kind of stopped posting this frequently. Um, I haven't seen anything too new from him lately. Let's see. Uh, okay, guys, well, I think that's it. This has been a long video. Um, thank you so much for being here. Still 38 of you on here, this, that's crazy. Um, thank you guys so much for being a part of this. Um, go make if you got a sewing machine, go make um, something with two different thread colors. I would love to see it and send me a picture. Ian works full time and has had some health issues. Nigel's in, in America teaching now in California. Cool, I didn't know that. I've never watched Nigel's videos. I, I need to go look it up, Nigel Armitage. Isn't that funny? Like, you'd think I would know. 
This is why this is why we need this community to like lift each other up and teach you. Now you guys just told me something I had ne- I didn't know about. I'm gonna go look him up and learn from him. Um, hashtag maker vloggery. Let's do this together, you guys. Get out there, make some videos. I don't care if you're just a hobbyist, if you're uh, got the biggest leather company in the world. I just I would love to see somebody frequently posting about their daily process in the maker world. If you're a woodworker, a uh, leather smith, um, they're, you know, making candles, whatever. There's so many things. And you could, you could be documenting that and uh, kind of contributing to this c- cool community that, that we're kind of growing here. And uh, so many benefits come from it. I know I, I talk about this all the time, but I could just go on and on about how rewarding it's been for us. So, okay, that's it. I keep talking. Sorry, you guys. Thank you so much for watching. I'm gonna go finish editing the weekend vlog from our uh, Harvest Market down at Sundance and I'll post that tomorrow morning. Or tonight, yeah, it'll be tomorrow morning. It'll be tomorrow. So thank you guys for watching. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye.